What's up guys, welcome back to News Dump, and a, and a kind of a special one, because it's like a corrections and omissions uh, episode of News Dump. <laughs> yeah, so right. we told you earlier this week that despite Mad Max director George Miller repeatedly talking about making more Mad Max films in basically every interview he's done since that movie came out, that he'd uh, apparently changed his mind and would not be making uh, any more Mad Max films. There you go. Okay. There you have it. According to the New York Post's page six publication, George Miller said at last Sunday's Golden Globe Awards, quote, I won't make more Mad Max movies. Your row was Charlie Theron, Zoe Kravitz, Rosie Huntington Whitley, and Riley Coe was forever getting completed. If you finish one in a year, it's considered a leap of faith. Start, stop, start again. I've shot in Australia in a field of wildflowers and flat red earth when it rained heavily forever. We had to wait 18 months and every return to the US was 27 hours. Those Mad Maxes take forever. I won't do those anymore. So, I mean, there you have it. George Miller very firmly stating that he will not do any more Mad Max movies. Or at least that's what you could safely assume reading those words that we just read under the headline, George Miller will never make another Mad Max movie. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that that was all bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, when asked about his comments on Wednesday, after Fury Road was announced as an Oscar nominee in 10 categories, Miller told The Wrap this. That was a completely garbled interview. I was in New York and it was so noisy and the journalist was asking me questions on a red carpet at the National Board of Review. She completely got the wrong fragments of information that were just not true. I said, no, another Mad Max movie will not be next. And she took that to mean I never wanted to make another Mad Max. It won't necessarily be next, but I have two more stories. So, okay, cool, great job, page six. Top-notch entertainment reporting. Anyway, now that that's settled, we can move on with our lives and move on with this news dump, comfortable in the knowledge that we'll be getting more Mad Max movies after all. Good. Just like we'd originally assumed yeah. before this story needlessly derailed all of our lives. Still holding out for that Inuri to uh, Mad Max, though. I mean, they could, I, you could do both. Why not both? You could have both. Uh, so moving on to real news, we both loved The Hateful Eight for lots of reasons. One of which is the fact that it's the closest thing to a stage play that Tarantino's ever made. And now, according to, again, reputable publication, The Wrap, Tarantino is saying he wants to go all the way with The Hateful Eight and actually make it into a play. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, after the Globes, Tarantino told The Wrap, I thought it out completely. I'm just waiting for this award season to be over so I can write it. Uh, he says that he plans to direct the stage version as well. Uh, that's cool. And he also revealed that Weinstein Company exec Harvey Weinstein had actually urged Tarantino to do The Hateful Eight as a stage play first. They kind of did with that private reading. Yeah, so, that's true. Kind of. And that, he has a lot of free time now because it got basically no Oscar nominations. Just a couple. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, it wouldn't be very difficult at all uh, to do an adaptation aside from a very small amount of changes. 95% of the movie takes place either inside of a stagecoach or at Minnie's haberdashery. So sets wouldn't that be that big of an issue either. Uh, and the story is mostly dialogue anyway. Uh, the biggest issue would probably be incorporating Tarantino's signature overuse of blood, but whatever. We're on board with this and hope to one day have enough money to afford to see it on Broadway. Yeah. So those things don't come cheap. For now though, Netflix fits our budgets just fine. And thanks to some faceless heroes on the internet, we now have access to a comprehensive list of very specific genres that Netflix uses to categorize their movies. And we mean specific. In the mood for a horror movie that takes place under the sea? Under the sea. Just go into your browser and type netflix.com slash browse slash genre slash 45028 and watch any of the terrible options presented to you. We'll leave a link in the description so you can go run wild with your newfound Netflix browsing powers. I only want to watch war movies where someone loses a leg. From the 80s. Go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Very specific. Anyway, speaking of Netflix, we loved their recent documentary series Making a Murder. Uh, if it's possible to love something that makes you shout at your TV repeatedly and slowly lose faith in humanity. Uh, the show's brought a significant amount of attention to its subjects, Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, who many believe are innocent of their crimes and are being wrongfully imprisoned. There's been all manner of petitions and whatnot, but this week we got a very unique piece of activism from Brendan Dassey's half-brother Brad who released this rap song, they didn't do it to the SoundCloud page. This thing really made my week. It was really something special. Special in quotes. Yeah, I I don't even know what to say about this. His heart's obviously in the right place. Yeah. He feels very strongly about wanting justice for his brother and his uncle. It's very close to him. But I, I don't know if this is really helping anyone. Probably not. hurting anything. But whatever, he got 250,000 plays on his SoundCloud page in just a couple days. Good for him. I'm sure the major labels have got the, the phone up and they're, where we gotta get this guy signed? Dassey, you're coming to Atlanta. The new Eminem. I love, like, they had him on, like, the local news, and he just looks, like, 
he wants to be like a Christian rapper. Yeah. But he makes no attempt at all to like make his image that of anything tied to like hip hop at all. Like he just looks like stay at home dad yeah. <laughs> who raps. Why not? It's his, it's his pastime. He does it because he loves it, Elliot, not because yeah. he's in it for the money. Okay? I admire that. Yeah. There you go. But speaking of terrible music we couldn't stop listening to and quoting this past week, even though we didn't really want to, it just like a damn earworm in there. Uh, at a Donald Trump rally in Pensacola, Florida last Wednesday, a group of young girls called the Freedom Girls performed whatever that is. President Donald Trump knows how to make America great. Deal from strength or get crushed every time. Da da da. Da 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 da. I'm surprised there wasn't a lyric "Don't vote for the Jew" in this somewhere because it seems like it would just fit in so perfectly with everything else that was going on in it. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm not surprised at all that there's apparently that much crossover between the Donald Trump crowd and the "I Sign My Children Up for Beauty Pageants" crowd. That's not, not shocking not at all. Not shocking at all. What? The audience is like into it. Too. Yeah. <laughs> when they finally get into it, they're like, "Wait, what?" Are we being trolled? Oh, we're not? This is serious? Okay, now I'm into it. It's very strange, it's very reminiscent of Hitler Youth and also uh, North, the Koreans, North Koreans. Uh, uh, yeah. To be fair, and we're saying this to be fair, there was an Obama song when he was running for yeah. campaign, but it was way less using strange. Anytime you use children, children in a political yeah. campaigning setting, that just makes me uncomfortable. But yeah, this one has a lot closer ties to uh, some very scary regimes. So anyways, another Freedom terrible <laughs> another terrible news. And for the last story in this news dump, uh, this week we not only lost David Bowie to cancer at age 69, we also lost Alan Rickman to cancer at age 69. And like with Bowie, it came pretty much out of the blue for the, for the public. Yeah, so Rickman will likely be remembered most for playing Professor Snape in the Harry Potter movies. But for people like us who are a little bit older, his role as Hans Gruber in the first Die Hard movie is one of the best villains in cinema history, and that was actually his first theatrical film wow. ever. He did swinging. Yeah, he did. A, he had done a few like BBC like made for TV movies, but this was his first like actual mm. big movie, and he just knocked it out of the park. Yeah, and according to everyone uh, who has ever worked with him, commenting on his passing, they they remarked on how, how nice of a guy he was, how supportive of a guy he was, and uh, Daniel Radcliffe uh, said that Rickman was the first adult Potter co-star to treat him like a peer, and that Rickman attended every single play Radcliffe. Have acted in, whether it was in New York or London. Yeah, and then like other people were just like, oh yeah, like anytime you need to get a hold of him, doesn't matter if you haven't talked to him in like 10 years, like he, he'll return your call in like six Not hours, doesn't matter like where he is in the world. Sounded like a real nice guy. Yeah. And a major part of pretty much everyone's lives who is. He's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, rest in peace, Alan Rickman. Uh, and we will see you guys tomorrow for our podcast where we talk about all of the Oscar nominations and what we think about it. And uh, you can join in our Oscar pool where we're going to just give each other cash if we win. Yeah. It's real gambling <laughs> in front of you, the yeah. viewer. Uh, <laughs> so check that out tomorrow. Watch a new episode of Tugs and a new weekly weird news over here. And uh, see you guys next time. Bye.